Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rob Murphy. I'm the executive director of the Institute for Global Health and director of the Center for Communicable Diseases, Global Communicable Diseases, uh, as well as I'm the John Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here and also Professor of Biomedical Engineering. Uh, thank you for taking the time today to join us this afternoon. Uh, this is our first Friday uh, seminar series, and the title is Rapid Acceleration of the Diagnosis of COVID-19, New Technologies for the Reopening of Businesses and Schools. Um, please take a moment to follow us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, hashtag uh, uh, FSM Global Health. Uh, in addition, we welcome you to become an Institute for Global Health member to receive access to special resources and services that support research infrastructure. For more information, please visit our website at globalhealth.northwestern.edu slash members. Today, we're very happy uh, to have with us Dr. Yukari Manabi, who will be joining me in the discussion of rapid acceleration of diagnostics, which we refer to as RADx. Uh, this is a program rolled out by the NIH, which you're gonna hear about now, uh, which is a fast track technology development program that is supporting novel solutions that will build US capacity for SARS-CoV-2 testing up to a hundredfold above what is achievable with standard approaches today. Dr. Manabe is a professor of medicine, Department of Medicine, Division of Infectious Diseases with the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. She has joint appointments in the Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, within the Departments of International Health and Molecular Microbiology and Immunology. And since 2012, she is Associate Director of Global Health Research and Innovation within the Johns Hopkins Center for Global Health. From 2007 into 2012, she was the head of research at the Infectious Diseases Institute at Makerere University College of Health Sciences in Kampala, Uganda. Within the new Center for Innovative Diagnostics and Infectious Diseases, she is dedicated to bringing Google innovation and rapid and point of care infectious diseases diagnostics to increase diagnostic certainty and targeted treatment. Her research has focused on HIV, TB, STIs, and the impact of infectious disease diagnostics, diagnostics on patient-centered outcomes. Finally, at the end, there's gonna be questions um, following both presentations in which you're able to submit your questions using the chat feature uh, directly uh, into questions at the bottom right-hand cor uh, corner of your screen. So I'll begin uh, the presentation for today. Um, and uh, let's see, get this uh, moving, okay. So here's our outline for today. Um, I'll start with the background and tell you what the point of care technologies research is and the RADx program. And then we'll uh, end the discussion today with uh, Dr. Manabi talking about current molecular and serologic assays. Um, please uh, keep your, uh, since we have so many people on the line, everybody but the speakers are muted. Questions and comments, like I said, use the chat. Uh, and the moderator will ask the speakers a selected question. Well, actually, they're going to forward them to me and I'll take them. So let me tell you a little bit how we got involved in this RADx project. Uh, it started with the Point of Care Technologies Research Network, or POCTRIN. POCTRIN is a, a, a part of the National Institute for Biomedical Engineering and uh, Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering uh, at the NIH. Uh, and it's a U54 grant national network that includes Johns Hopkins, where Dr. Manabi is, and Northwestern, uh, where, me, where I am, uh, as long with uh, Sally McFall, uh, and a variety of other people that work with us. Included in this Pachter network, though, is Georgia Tech and Emory, uh, and also the University of Massachusetts. And we're all organized by a coordinating center called CIMIT uh, that's based at Mass General Hospital. So we're all involved in point of care uh, networks. So I'll tell you a little bit about ours uh, to remind you, because this is actually where the whole Radix program actually started for us. So ours is called CTHAN, the Center for Innovation and Point of Care Technologies for HIV AIDS at Northwestern. Uh, and uh, Sally McFall in the Biomedical Engineering Department and I are the co-directors of this. So we have four cores that include Sally running the technology development, Chad Achenbach uh, running the uh, clinical translational and validation core, and Kara Pellamon from the Kellogg School running the technology training and dissemination core. And uh, I'm the chair of the admin core with Sally. So that's our, our, our uh, setup. And then we have seven African sites uh, for our uh, biomedical engineering, uh, and mostly bio, predominantly biomedical engineering sites and three are clinical sites. So our biomedical engineering sites are down here uh, in South Africa at Cape Town and Stellenbosch, which are very close to each other. 
Uh, we uh, had started two biomedical engineering departments at the University of Lagos and the University of Ibadan. They're up here. And then we have the clinical sites at the University of Bamako, University of Jos in Nigeria, and Muhambili University in Tanzania. So that is our, uh, our CFAN uh, network. So we're in the middle of this grant right now, uh, this five-year grant. And we've come up with a variety of technologies. Uh, these uh, awards come out, the next awards are due, I think, September 1st. Uh, and uh, we give between 50 and $100,000 uh, per award. Anyone uh, in the world literally uh, can apply for these. Uh, and, but they have to have, uh, be related to uh, HIV or a complication of HIV. So as you can see here, these are some of the projects. Most of them are related to TB, but we also have uh, uh, um, things related to viral hepatitis uh, as well. Now, everything was uh, going along just fine. And then of course we had the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and everything changed. Uh, all the studies we were doing pretty much uh, came to a halt. Uh, and we were told by the NIH to, we need to pivot uh, to COVID-19. Um, so uh, dealing with this ep epidemic involves social engineering but it also involves the bioengineering. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about both, but we're gonna focus on the bioengineering. So as far as the social engineering uh, is concerned, the whole idea of social distancing is actually nothing new. If you look back at the influenza of 1918, uh, there was very similar to what was happening today. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> President Wilson basically ignored the whole thing uh, and he, there was really nothing coming from the central government. And not only were the, actually even the states weren't as involved as the cities. The cities actually were kind of driving the social uh, distancing and, uh, and uh, social engineering component of it. And there's been a lot written about this. Uh, there's this uh, very famous uh, uh, slide, uh, the data comparing Philadelphia to St. Louis. In Philadelphia, they basically did nothing uh, at the beginning. They had parades, the bars were open. Uh, a lot of things were going on there. They did basically didn't do anything. And of course they had this huge peak uh, in the death rate uh, due to uh, influenza. In St. Louis, they took the opposite approach, closed things down, everybody wearing masks, and they had a significantly blunted response. And uh, follow up on that, uh, the economic recovery uh, after the whole epidemic was, uh, was over, uh, definitely favored uh, the, the cities that uh, did uh, the more strict uh, uh, so, uh, social engineering components. Imperial College London has done some modeling here um, and looking at the impact of social distancing, whether it be short, uh, two weeks or longer, two months. And you can see there's a, from a modeling point of view, there's a very significant uh, decrease uh, in uh, the total number of infections uh, and everything else, including hospitalizations, ICUs and death. Uh, looking at ICUs, which is a, one of the first places things really get clogged up uh, as patients uh, enter the hospital, um, this is also uh, uh, projected data. Um, so if you do nothing, this is what happens in the black here. Uh, and then if you do case isolation, isolation household quarantine, close the schools and the universities, do all that, uh, you see the blue bump here, uh, you can significantly uh, decrease this ICU bed need. Now, what's happening with our uh, effect of social distancing? This is actually a very recent picture of what it looks like in Florida. Um, as you can see from here, there's nobody is even wearing a mask and nobody's even trying to do any kind of social distancing. So of course that has led to this huge explosion of cases uh, in the South, Florida, uh, Georgia, South Carolina, uh, most of the other Southern states, Arizona particularly hard uh, as well. So if you look at the country data specifically, now we have uh, actually 3,118,000 cases uh, as of today. And you can see that uh, right around here, there were probably more cases. We weren't hardly testing anybody, but there's been this straight line up. And then towards the end of May, which would be here, a lot of places started uh, 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 when they re reduced the restrictions, uh, and now you actually see a steeper kind of incline here. This is actually the number of daily reported uh, cases. It's probably easier to see it on here. Here we have when New York was in all the trouble, uh, you see this peak here. Uh, and then uh, with all the uh, shelter in place orders and everything, things came down. And then after Memorial Day, 
with many states opening up, uh, you see this peak. We've never had this many cases before, over 60,000 cases uh, per day. Now, around the world, uh, people are taking different, uh, having different uh, uh, effect on this. If you look at Germany, uh, I just use them as just one example. There's many countries uh, that are like this. Here they had the steep rise here, had all the social distancing, social engineering put in place, and it's relatively flat. Here's their daily caseload here. They haven't had that second big bump and they're down to a dull row here. Look at the, uh, the scale here. This is only 200,000 scale. Remember the US scale is 3 million and the number of cases here uh, is uh, well below 500 cases uh, per day. So it can work and it can be sustained, but uh, and this is just with social engineering uh, and it can work. So what are our options left in the United States? Well, social distancing and masks, let's just face it, it's not working uh, in most places. Um, and we have to do something different. Well, we can wait for a vaccine. There's Operation Warp Speed. I have one slide, I'm gonna show you about that in a second. Let's hope it works. Uh, we could wait for better treatment. Um, the treatments that are approved now are remdesivir, um, the Gilead drug and dexamethasone, steroids, common steroid drug. But the, typically they're used in very late hospitalized patients and the treatment is basically too late. We need something that you can take earlier. Another approach, and that's what we're gonna talk about today, Radix, is test, 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 and quarantine those that are infected. And what's happening now though, if we really try to increase the testing, we don't have the capacity. Right now, we're barely keeping up with people having to wait hours to get a test, confusion about who's paying for the test, uh, and waiting up to five days uh, to get the results of a test. Uh, all these things are, are not good. So we've got to increase the capacity. There's another approach we can do is just say, forget it. This is like the Brazilian model. Do nothing, let it run its course, and then, but unfortunately, that's gonna result in killing millions of people. Now here's uh, Operation Warp Speed, uh, you see here. Um, this was announced uh, May 15th. Uh, here they had a, these are obviously physicians mostly because they're all doing their social distancing. But here in the back with the yellow arrow is Francis Collins, head of the NIH. And this one over here is uh, Bruce Stromberg, who's head of NIBIB, the National Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Bio Bioengineering. Uh, so they were part of this whole thing. Uh, and uh, so far, they recently, Nova, Nova, um, Novavax uh, got a very significant chunk of uh, funding to uh, start manufacturing their vaccine, even though the studies aren't even anywhere close to being over. Uh, the other funds that you see up here and the companies uh, was given by BARDA, another uh, US uh, agency, uh, and it's all fall, falls under the Operation Warp Speed uh, umbrella. So the money is going out to manufacture the products before they're even proved uh, to be effective so that they're gonna be ready uh, if, if it works. So there's a lot of ifs in there, uh, but it's basically a, a, an insurance uh, ploy. So regarding um, uh, the ramping up for the testing, uh, Congress on March 27th uh, passed a, a huge bill, a coronavirus aid bill, and uh, the NIH got $804 million of this. Uh, 60 million went to NIBIB, um, NIAID got $500 55 million, and you can see the other institutes that were funded here. Um, so we, our, our CFAN and Pachtrin grant, uh, we were part of this uh, chunk here, and we prepared a modest supplement to uh, pivot our uh, research, and we were doing that. And then along came Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee, uh, and he said, you know, we, we just need to increase this testing. And so this was actually very bold of him because at that time, the central administration was saying, we have enough tests. Anybody that wants a test can get a test, which of course was not true. But anyway, so on April 24th, uh, the fourth supplement was passed and 1.8 billion uh, went to the NIH for testing. So that ended up being Radix. So the, it was signed into law the 24th. Five days later, we launched Radix. Radix, so Poptrin, uh, our CTAN grant, and the Hopkins, uh, same, their, their uh, counterpart, we all end up being in this RADx thing. And what we wanna do is expand the number, type, access, and throughput of testing technologies and help in any way. And the, the, the plan is to, the, the 
target our asymptomatic people to be home-based, point of care, hospital, whatever, uh, and uh, anything we can do to increase the, this testing capacity. So RADx actually turns out to ha have four different components. Uh, what I'm talking about and what Dr. Manabi is going to be talking about is RADx Tech. This is the $500 million uh, plan that I'm going to talk about in detail. There is another one that was launched called RADx Underserved Populations or RADx UP, another 500 million. Uh, there's an RFA out there due on the 7th of August. Um, and a lot of, I know a lot of people in Chicago are applying for that. There's RADx Rad, um, Radical. Uh, so radical technologies that don't meet the timeline of RADx Tech, and you'll see that in a second. And then there's RADx Advanced Testing Program. This is a ATP. Uh, and this is any technology that can uh, really just en enhance the throughput, uh, ultra high throughput machines and facilities. So those are the, the ones that are there. So RADx <coughs> Tech, they had the call out April 28th, asking people for ideas. Um, those that make it to phase zero uh, after uh, sitting in this, uh, uh, this Shark Tank-like uh, procedure, or what we call a deep dive, they get uh, intensively uh, reviewed, uh, and then a number of them will pass into phase one, which is only four to six weeks long, uh, and that's to de-risk uh, the project. Uh, and then the successful ones will go to phase two and really scale up their technology uh, and have this ready by the end of summer or early fall 2020. So it's very close. I mean, it's, this is a really, really fast uh, timeline. So the uh, number of submissions were really big at the beginning. It's kind of uh, gone down a little bit uh, lately, but there are still submissions and the, and the submission process is still open. So um, now here's what happens uh, with uh, these events, these uh, applications. So uh, there were about seven applications from Northwestern. Uh, there could have been more. We don't, I don't really know because of the, what happens uh, is shown here. So you submit, it goes to this viability panel that looks at it. Uh, they can get other uh, opinions from people. Uh, they can ask them to resubmit with more information. Uh, and ultimately, uh, it's going to come to a, a group at the NIH that decides whether it's just rejected uh, or it redirected someplace else, or it goes into this Shark Tank deep dive uh, review with this uh, panel of experts. Then, uh, once it makes it through there, it comes to the steering panel, which Dr. Manabi and I uh, sit on with uh, our colleagues. We get one vote as a Pochran Center. There are NIH observers here, but I think there's only 16 uh, voting members. And so we review the deep dive uh, recommendation uh, and uh, we vote on it um, as to whether it should uh, get the rejected, redirected, or go to work package one, uh, which is this four to six week period. Uh, in some cases, they can actually go directly to work package two, but ultimately that will be the question. Uh, and, but it, uh, it, after the, the panel makes a recommendation, but the NIH makes actually the, finest, uh, the final decision here. So that's the process. And this is a little bit uh, cumbersome slide here, but there were 2,552 applications started, uh, 586 were completed. If you consider that it's the, the first really successful step is to get into this deep dive shark tank thing, it ends up being 108 uh, were recommended to go to the deep dive. Uh, and then the NIH cut that down to 96. Uh, and then uh, that dropped down uh, to, with the deep dive group to 93. Um, and they recommended to get to work package one after the deep dive, 29. Uh, and uh, then it comes to the steering panel and we recommended 23, but then the NIH put three of them back in there. So that ended up being 26. So 26 out of all those applications ends up being just 4.4%, but they also recommend a redirect to a different agency uh, to fund them. And that's another 3.6. So overall, it was 7.6% uh, of the applications actually uh, had a, a favorable outcome. And one of them was the uh, Sally McFall, my, uh, my co-PI, 
uh, and Dave Kelso uh, in biomedical engineering uh, in their uh, DASH program. It's a rapid PCR. Uh, you heard a little bit about this at one of these uh, seminars a couple weeks ago, or a couple months ago, excuse me. It's a PCR a result in 15 minutes, minimal operator steps, qualitative and quantitative, uh, CLIA wave, no refrigeration, cold chain required. This is the cartridge here, about the size of a credit card. Uh, and uh, it's got Bluetooth, uh, smartphone, internet uh, uh, interaction. And this is a coffee machine, just to give you an idea of what the actual uh, size of the equipment is here. Two module system right here. So uh, very exciting project. So this is a uh, real PCR, uh, very fast, 15 minutes, runs tests as fast as the specimens can be collected basically. Um, and uh, very portable, fits into a suitcase, operates at a variety of uh, temperature ranges, and it will be ready to uh, scale up in the first quarter of 2021. And that's why it got kicked out of Radix Tech and got put in Radix Rad, because they, uh, it couldn't make the timeline uh, that was required for the, uh, for the other one. Uh, highly, the tests that have been done, and some of you have participated here in getting samples for them, we really appreciate that. Uh, but uh, the, every, everything really is working uh, incredibly well. So uh, once these uh, products get down uh, after the work package one, they're gonna have to actually get clinically tested. And um, so we have to do clinical studies with this. And some of you are involved with me in uh, doing these um, clinical studies uh, to validate it in the populations and settings where it's going to be used. So here is the new logo we just uh, uh, got adopted yesterday uh, called COVID-19 Test US. Um, but anyway, that um, is being run out of the University of Massachusetts, and so we get a subcontract from them uh, to do that. So uh, the places where uh, the NIH has defined uh, for use are listed here. So there's large-scale semi-contained, which are like manufacturing plants, universities like Northwestern or Hopkins, any kind of large event where you, you any place where you know you will be able to track the people that were there. Then there's large scale public where you're never gonna find the people again, probably like airports. Then there's a small medium version of that, both semi-contained and public. Uh, everything from daycare centers, restaurants, prisons, uh, uh, religious institutions, churches, synagogues, mosques, whatever. Then there's non-hospital healthcare, retail health, immediate care or testing sites, uh, stuff like that. And then there's home uh, use. So for home testing, like a pregnancy test. So those are the, the different groups. So, um, so, the, uh, what, so we're, the, the interventions uh, are in all those different groups uh, and the platform they're gonna use is going to be standard. Everyone will be compared to what quote the gold standard is, which is really no gold standard, but it's gonna be a standard. Uh, there's a master protocol and a consent, and uh, they're going to have a, a single uh, IRB. But uh, it's it's if they don't, we don't want to use a central IRB. We can use our own IRB. Um, and so we've been in, we work with the FDA, uh, and each one of these devices that comes down the line uh, is uh, going to have to be tested. If they want to get everything, has to come in with the emergency use authorization. Uh, however. They want to really get down to this FDA 510K submission. And to do that, they've got to study at least 193 asymptomatic patients, that's a minimum, and end up with 20 true positives uh, and the rest true negatives. So that's uh, actually our goal. And so we've been trying to identify uh, patient groups uh, that we can study, and we have identified some. And that will be done at Emory, Hopkins, Northwestern, and the University of Massachusetts and UCSF which is actually monitoring the survey that will have to be filled out with each one of these tests. They're using the Eureka platform that was developed by NHLBI. Uh, a lot of people have already done this particular uh, survey before, and uh, it's relatively easy to do. It's, a, it's an app on your phone. You can do it on the phone. Uh, we, our last meeting we had about this, they were talking about giving it to people to do while they're waiting in line in their car to get tested. So. Um, it, it takes about 10 minutes. So in conclusion, uh, for my component of this uh, presentation, we're currently testing uh, SARS-CoV-2 in about 600,000 people per day in the United States. We can barely keep up with the current demand. Um, many people have to wait for hours even to get the test and up to five days to get the results. 
And this goal of Radix is to ramp up capacity by as much as a hundredfold, which is an amazing number. Uh, and uh, with this massive testing capacity, small, medium, large businesses, schools, and population groups can be tested in a reasonable time period with the results either back within a few minutes to a maximum of one day. Innovative, less expensive, effective testing. Uh, it's uh, really what uh, is going to happen, and it is going to happen. And now, uh, that's my part, and I'm going to introduce the next speaker, uh, Professor Yuka Manabi. Thank you. Yuka? Great. I'm going to stop sharing here. Go ahead. So thanks very much for the very generous uh, introduction earlier, <laughs> Rob. <laughs> much appreciated. Um, so today, uh, I'm going to kind of step back a little bit and talk a little bit more generally about um, SARS-CoV-2. Can you see that as a full screen presentation, Rob? Yes, yes, yeah, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the Hopkins dashboard that many of you have seen on multiple occasions. I just downloaded this before the talk. We now have over 12 million confirmed cases and 555,000 global deaths. And unfortunately, the U.S. case rate really leads the pack. Um, so I wanted to start back at the beginning. This is a really nice paper that was published in um, Nature back in February. Um, remember that coronaviruses are enveloped positive strand RNA viruses that are found in mammals and birds. It's thought that these viruses originated in bats. In this phylogenetic tree where the relatedness is um, measured by how close they are listed here in this phylogenetic tree, we have alpha coronaviruses down here and beta coronaviruses, and you know that SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus. Here they are listed, some of the Wuhan strains from early on, and uh, they're clustered here. And you can see that their no nearest neighbor is a bat cov um, I also have listed on this slide, just for your own information, two alpha coronaviruses underlined in blue and two beta. These are the upper respiratory tract infections that lead to about a third of the common colds in the respiratory season. We also have MERS-CoV-2, which you know is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, as well as the original SARS back in 2003, which was um, a, a big problem, but was quite different really than this one in that it was quite self-contained at like about 8,000 cases. The real reason to show you this slide, though, is just to get a sense of what the genome looks like of SARS. So these are open reading frames. Nobody really knows what they do. Um, here's the S or the spike protein, the thing that's around the edges of the uh, coronavirus that gives it its name. And then here, the N gene, the nucleocapsid gene. I want to highlight these because they're going to come up several times during this talk. It's also interesting to see here what the nucleotide identity is across some of these strains. And you'll see that some of the biggest variances are in the spike protein. So this turns out to be a good um, place to look if you want to find a unique uh, region for molecular tests and also is a nice target for, um, for antibody tests, which we'll hear about later. So I just want to remind you about the COVID-19 um, testing timeline. WHO calls um, the cluster of cases uh, uh, in Wuhan uh, to be a global health emergency. They released a protocol for RT-PCR testing and the speed at which the genome came out was truly remarkable. We had um, first confirmed COVID cases in the US. CDC at that time also asked for FDA permission to be able to use their test. Others develop a test. CDC formally gets its test out, but you all know that there are issues with the test. And um, clinical microbiologists really complain that the FDA needs to loosen regulations. Now there are emergency use authorizations and starting sometime in the middle of March, there's a huge number of tests that then get elaborated that are both lab developed tests as well as commercially available tests. By May 25th, more than 99% of the testing that's done in the United States is done by private labs. And in fact, public health labs play a very small role. So the next thing I wanted to bring up is just a little bit about the timeline of SARS-CoV-2 infection, also known as COVID-19, that's the disease. So say you get infected here at time zero with time along the X axis, and the red line represents what happens to the virus. Virus elaborates during an asymptomatic phase and then symptoms come on, and then slowly, usually this viral load declines over time. Some people have a longer trajectory than others, and that's probably largely um, 
due to your host response. In this sort of middle section, here are all the different antibodies that can get elaborated. Um, here's total antibody, and then you see usually it's IgM, IgA, IgG, though depending on the target, interestingly, M and G can come up around the same time. In general, total antibody correlates with severity with those that are sicker having a bigger response. Um, in general, incubation is around five days, but has a range from two to 14 days, which has really been a problem. Symptoms about 12 days, um, sometime between days eight and 16 of symptoms is when people start to get really sick. Here you see the viral response phase, a pulmonary period, and then largely um, some of the symptoms or most of the symptoms in hospitalized patients are due to the host inflammatory response. Also because of that, you find that the mean time of death in a nice Lancet article was about 18 days. Oh, sorry, and seroconversion occurs sometime around uh, between five and 10 days. Most people after 14 days will develop a response if they're gonna develop a response. So here are the automated molecular testing platforms from March 12th when the FDA EUA loosened and many of them started to get approved to present. There are now 16 automated integrated diagnostic tests for SARS-CoV-2. Remember when I say integrated here, I mean that the RNA extraction and the amplification occur on the same automated platform. Five of these are molecular cartridge-based devices, four of which are designed to be used at point of care. The Genmark Eplex is a big tower and not meant to be used at point of care. So here are the ones that you might have seen before, Cepheid Expert Express. This is used already for flu and RSV. Similarly, the BioFire Film Array is also currently being used for respiratory viruses, Abbott ID Now, and Misa Biotech. What's interesting though, is that they have differing amounts of time. So 45 minutes here for Cephi at an hour for the film array, 13 minutes for Abbott ID now. But of all the platforms, this one perhaps uh, has the lowest sensitivity and then the Mesa Biotech. Um, there are also antigen assays. So now we're still detecting the virus. We're not looking for a viral RNA, but now we're looking for antigens within that. This one um, finds the nucleocapsid. This is a lateral flow uh, sandwich assay, it takes 15 minutes. It looks qualitatively for a nucleocapsid protein antigen and its clinical sensitivity compared to molecular devices is about 80%. Um, and I have down here at the bottom, many more of these antigen tests are likely coming. They're gonna have similar sensitivity to this SOFIA there are some that have innovation that may make them slightly more sensitive. Many of these are amenable to lateral flow. So for those of you like me that work in resource limited settings, um, lateral flow could be very attractive. One might argue that the US currently is a resource limited setting and as such may benefit also from these types of tests. So the next question is, what's the sample type? So all of you seen the nasopharyngeal swabbing that's on the news, the one where you stick a swab way back until you get through the nose and all the way into the back of the throat. Um, these are difficult to perform yourself. Most times you have to have somebody do it for you. I would say they are generally unpopular. Um, now what we found doing um, sensitivity studies, comparing them, we find that mid-turbinate nasal tends to be very similar to nasopharyngeal. So if you look at this figure on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll notice that this, this um, swab ends right where the nares, uh, sorry, when the nose, nasal cavity is narrowing. And if you get a swab there, we find that in general, that, that's a pretty good sample. Um, most people find that in these different swabs, you're gonna get between 10 to the sixth and 10 to the nine copies per swab. The throat can also be used, though the level of virus tends to be slightly lower, so in some comparison studies, it's less sensitive. Sputum is nice in people who are in the hospital and may have very high copy number, but also um, uh, it is difficult sample type to work with because it's a little more viscous. Stool has been really interesting. We have found copies in stool, but as you can imagine, working with stool is not straightforward. It's interesting that we should find it in stool, though we know that ACE2 receptors, the receptor type to which SARS-CoV-2 binds, does exist all through the GI tract. 
The place that we found some surprises is the blood, where less than 5% of molecular tests in patients who are known NP swab positive are positive. And in urine, despite the fact that there are a lot of ACE2 receptors in the kidney, are not, it's not detectable. So what are the performance characteristics? By and large, the molecular tests have similar sensitivities across the automated molecular platforms, as I said, except for Abbott ID now. But one might argue that a slightly less sensitive platform used in the asymptomatic period for screening may be okay, and I'll talk about that a little later. So the variability really occurs with the sample type though. So it, not all sample types are gonna be the same. So saliva has also been put forward as a potentially equivalent sample type. Some for passive drool, others for coughing up what's in the back of your mouth, others for spitting into a cup. I think what we know is that if you compare an NP swab to saliva, you may just in that comparison find lower sensitivity in the saliva. But interestingly, the saliva picks up some people that the NP swab misses. So what we're finding is that this is a very heterogeneous disease and the sample type, the timing in the disease, um, and the adequacy of the sample all are going to matter when it comes to sensitivity. Here you see one article where they compared saliva to endotracheal aspirate. And on many occasions, um, there's a disparity. So they don't always match up, but both sample types have their merits. Here's another one from Ann Wiley's group from Yale. This is actually now no longer a Med Archive article. I think it's coming out soon. I think she said New England Journal. Um, 46 nasopharyngeal swabs, 39 salivas. And what you can see here is that in general, um, there is slight improvement with saliva. When you look at the matched samples, some of the NP swabs are low in saliva, but many of the NP swabs are slightly better. Sorry, yeah. And some of the nasopharyngeal swabs with low titers ha have higher titers uh, in saliva. And if you look over here um, in this article, she argues that in general, more of these dots are on the left side of the concordance line showing that maybe saliva is superior to, um, to MP swab. I will say that the jury's still out and to me spitting into a cup until the urine cup is a third full could be quite time consuming. So I think we need to think that through. This is a nice, um, uh, review that was done by one of the medical students here at Hopkins, uh, Razvan Azamfire, who basically looked at 30 articles where the size of the circle is equal to the number of patients that were in this particular review. Open circles show severe patients, closed circles show patients that had less severe disease. And in general, what you find is that people shed virus for somewhere between 20 and 30 days. So it's important to think that through when you're ordering another MP swab by molecular test for a patient where they may be still persistently positive, but this would be the norm. It's also interesting that severity doesn't really, um, more severe disease doesn't shed for longer. It's also interesting to see that um, there are quite a few relatively small circles though that show that stool may show the virus for longer than respiratory specimens. Um, the next thing I wanted to bring up is what's the correlation then between RT-PCR positivity, culture positivity, and transmission? So what I think is that it's very difficult to culture virus after 10 days in now multiple studies. Here are two illustrative studies, one from Germany and another one on the right-hand side from the CDC, showing that if you look at patients uh, and different uh, specimen types, and you look at the positivity of the culture, you don't find any positive cultures in this study uh, past eight or nine days. Then um, if you look down at the bottom panels, with the y-axis being the proportion of positive cultures and the days after onset of symptoms, this is again illustrated now as a smoothed curve. If you go to the right-hand panel and look at the number of RNA copies per ml and the likelihood of having a positive culture, obviously having more virus leads to um, a, a higher likelihood of a positive culture. Shown differently here as the cycle threshold of a patient sample with low cycle thresholds, meaning more virus, you can find that in general, those who recover culturable virus have high, I'm sorry, higher viral load, lower CT values. Um, and these are for gene N1, N2, N3, three parts of the nucleocapsid gene, and this is a human gene control. 
How culture positivity links with transmissibility is yet unknown, but intuitively one would think that if you can culture the virus, it's more likely to be transmissible. And herein lie the recommendations from CDC, where a person who has had more than 10 days of symptoms and have been asymptomatic for three days can go back to work. So here's a quote from Hippocrates, declare the past, diagnose the present, and foretell the future. Um, uh, Rob showed you some of this data, and I'm just going to reiterate one point. We look at lessons from the 1918 flu epidemic, and we look at a study of weekly pneumonia influenza mortality data for 43 cities from, 19, uh, from the 1918 epidemic. This is an analysis that was actually published in 2007 in JAMA, and had we paid attention to it, maybe we would have done differently than we did. Um, here they talk about the non-pharmaceutical interventions that were pursued during the 1918 influenza epidemic, which includes school closure, public gathering bans, isolation, and quarantine. One of the cities that really stood out um, as a city that had a really robust public health system was New York City. What you can see in the graphs at the bottom is the y-axis shows excess deaths per 100,000 population, and here the public health response time. In fact, even before things were um, obvious, New York City in, put in all of these non-pharmaceutical interventions and in fact had some of the lowest excess mortality per 100,000 population. As you can see, there's a positive correlation. If it took you longer to respond, you had a higher death rate. Here we see a reverse correlation in the plot to the right where the total number of days that you've pursued this non-pharmaceutical intervention um, foretold how many excess deaths you would have. So if you kept your interventions on for longer, you tended to have lower death rates. So what's happened here in the US, we did some pharmaceutical, non-pharmaceutical interventions and we started to see a lowering curve, but we now have new cases that have outstripped our first uh, peak. And in many cities, what happened here was what happened in 1918, which is that they stopped their intervention before things were really under control. And in 1918, the same thing happened where people's second peaks would be bigger than their first peak if they stopped early. Now in the US, now this is as of July 5th, I think we are unfortunately higher than this now since we're at 60,000 cases per day. So the last thing I wanted to talk about was serological testing. People ask me about this all the time. To do that, I need to tell you a little bit more about the virus. Um, as of the 5th, there were 26 serologic assays that had uh, FDA emergency use authorization. Globally, there are many more than that. In general, they detect different antigens, so you have to check and see. Some, the S1 part of the spike protein, others the S2. These two parts break apart when the furin uh, breaks apart the spike protein in order to facilitate entry through the ACE2 receptor. The spike protein also has something called the receptor binding domain, which is the really specific part to SARS-CoV-2. And then nucleocapsid, which is on the inside of the virus, as you can see here in the cartoon. Now remember with spike protein, full length spike can be less specific because many parts of the spike to a protein are shared with other coronaviruses, but it is quite sensitive. Receptor binding domain tends to be the most specific, sometimes less sensitive, and the receptor binding domain has to be in the standing up position as seen in the cartoon at the bottom. So here the RBD is lying down and this is probably to evade your immune system. But after it's pre-activated by furin, it stands up like this. And when you make antibody to the standing up RBD, this seems to correlate with neutralizing immunity. Nucleocapsid, however, is the target in most of the automated platforms. To date, it's actually shown good specificity. But remember, I told you at the very beginning, this is an area of the genome that varies less within coronaviruses. And potentially, you could imagine that you would have um, false positives as well. The type of serologic tests are uh, rapid tests, lateral flow tests, like a pregnancy. They can be point of care and take very little time. Um, and they can find IgM, IgG, um, to antigens that are specific for SARS-CoV-2. ELISA is a higher throughput platform, can take two to five hours. It's kind of nice because you get a cutoff, you get a number that you can look at. So it's sort of semi-quantitative, but it's definitely a lab-based test. And then neutralizing assays, of course, the um, 
the gold standard in the sense that neutralization uh, titers are the ones that correlate with perhaps your ability to uh, not get subsequently reinfected with SARS-CoV-2. This is definitely a lab-based test, must be done in biosafety level three, um, and you get a titer at the end of it. it. Takes three to five days, however. So this is really prohibitive and likely is only being done in real centers that study coronavirus. So what's the use case for an individual? Should you get tested with a serologic test? Um, well, it can be used to diagnose infection in patients who are NP swab negative. So all of us have seen patients in the hospital we think really have COVID-19, but their first NP swab was negative and false negatives have been described. So after 10 to 14 days, when I showed you in the graph when people are most likely to make an antibody, you could do an antibody test to see whether or not you're right that they were exposed, especially if they have more IgM, IgA compared to IgG. Um, you can also look for COVID exposure in the, in the past. If you want to know if someone was exposed to SARS-CoV-2. What I would say about this though is you should probably only do it if you had a, an illness that's credible and consistent with COVID-19 or if you had somebody that you know had COVID-19 who's in your household or was a close contact to you. Essential workers may also benefit from this kind of testing. Um, but what we found is among essential workers in New York City who had a COVID-like illness in the months preceding when COVID was circulating, only a third of them end up having COVID, um, anti-COVID-19 antibodies. Here you can see, uh, I brought this up before, that the peak time for IgM and IgG almost overlap at 10 days, but of course there are people that can get it earlier. A neutralizing antibody usually comes up around the same time. But what's interesting is um, that if you look at serologic immune responses in patients who are known to have COVID-19, they were RT-PCR positive. In this study by Sabra Klein at Hopkins, 126 convalescent plasma donors that were more than 28 days after RT-PCR confirmed infection had IgG titers measured. And she measured mostly to spike, either full length spike or receptor binding domain. And what you find is that IgG was the one that had the largest area under the curve, meaning there was the most IgG compared to M and A. And that the spike receptor binding domain IgG had the highest correlation with neutralizing titers. Um, being male, being older, and being hospitalized correlated with having antibodies. So more severe disease, more antibody. Sadly, only 80% had neutralizing titers. And so not everybody that gets known COVID-19 COVID disease as measured by RT-PCR, in fact, make um, serologic responses. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about SARS-CoV-2 superpower. So unlike SARS-CoV-1 or the original SARS-CoV, asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic people can um, pass disease. And that's been the real problem. So if you look in this very nice study by Melissa Ahrens and colleagues from the state of Washington, looking at assisted living facilities, there were 16 um, residents that had typical symptoms, four that had atypical, 24 pre-symptomatic, and three that were asymptomatic. If you look here, the open circles that are red represent patients who are culture positive. If you look at the black diamonds, those are people who had a negative culture. And what you can see is in general, again, this cutoff of about 25 seems to be where people are most likely to be culture positive. If you're lower than that, meaning you have a higher viral burden, you're more likely to culture out. However, in pre-symptomatic patients, there are a few over here which don't have a lot of RNA, but interestingly, culture out. And again, here in the asymptomatic people who culture out. And so I think there's virologic evidence that in pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic, they have culturable virus and potentially transmissible virus. And we have a lot of epidemiologic evidence in people who were exposed to asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people who then two to 11 days later would then develop disease. So what does this mean? I think now in some transmission modeling that's been done, this is from Christoph Frazier's group who's in the UK, Probably almost half of the R naught, as we say, R naught of two here means that if you're one person with SARS-CoV-2 or with COVID-19 disease, you can transmit to two people. Almost half of that comes from pre-symptomatic patients um, who are then giving it to other people before they know. Symptomatic is another 0.8 of the two. 
And environmental, remember early on we were all wearing gloves and we were afraid to touch anything, is probably very little of the transmission of this disease. So what are the implications of this modeling transmission data? Probably our case fatality rate is actually lower than what we measured because there's a lot of cases. Recently, the CDC came out and said that there are probably 10 times more cases than we have measured in the US. Also, community interventions to slow transmission, social distancing, and face masks are necessary to try to prevent these asymptomatic and presymptomatic people from transmitting to others. And I think that we need to increase the capacity for widespread testing and contact tracing, particularly in cities where we've managed to get the curve to drop and we're now trying to keep it contained. So um, because of the time and maybe to leave a little bit of time, I refer you to this nice Lancet article where they looked at the effect of physical distancing, face mask and eye protection, showing that you could decrease your risk, for example, just with social distancing from 12.8% down to 2.6, 17% down to 3% with face masks. And finally, so in summary, we've now had over 12 million cases worldwide with evidence of sustained transmission, particularly in the US. Molecular, RT-PCR, and antigen tests directly detect the virus and is what we're doing in RADx tech that um, Rob told you about. The relationship between RT-PCR positivity Cultural virus and transmission definitely needs more data. And serologic tests really should not be used to diagnose acute disease. And remember, of those um, that uh, get infected and are known to be RT-PCR positive, only 80% develop neutralizing immunity. And you're more likely to develop neutralizing immunity if you had a more severe infection. Asymptomatic and presymptomatic patients account for a significant proportion of transmitted infection. And really social distancing, masking, and non-pharmaceutical interventions really need to be adopted if we hope to get on top of this epidemic. So with that, I'll end there and uh, pass Great. it back to Rob. Yeah, well, now there's, uh, we're open for questions. Um, and uh, let's see. The, uh, I have one, just one question here so far. Um, one of the commonalities between the states with the highest number of cases at the moment are states with very hot summers like Texas and Florida, Sunbelt states, and a common trend in those states is rampant use of air conditioning. In March, uh, there were higher cases uh, where indoor heating was more prevalent. Uh, European and Asian countries tend to use less AC and heating than Americans and that they were able to tackle the cases faster than us. So what's the true impact uh, environmentally of air conditioning and indoor heating, forced air heat, I presume we're talking about. Uh, um, what is the true impact of that? Uh, we know that air recirculation is up 80% with indoor AC and heating systems. Um, we didn't really address uh, that other than uh, talk about how the environmental um, impact is relatively small. Uh, Yuka, you have any comment? I mean, I think early on we sort of hoped like SARS-CoV-1 that we would see less SARS once summer came. Um, I do think that UV helps. So for example, if you want to eat with your friends, I think eating outdoors in the UV may be better than sitting in a restaurant where there is no, um, no UV. I do know of several outbreaks that were related to air conditioning systems within restaurants where the index case would be seated like near the AC and then the AC would blow across and there was sort of a cone thing where the person who was asymptomatically infected <clears throat> then infected people that were downstream from the AC. So there is that risk. I would say that there are known super spreaders. There are people that seem to give the disease away quite well. And I think it probably is related on some level to airflow because people make an aerosol and where that aerosol goes matters. Um, but I'm not sure that so much answers your question. I will say that, um, that I don't think it's just related to air handling. Um, but closed spaces are obviously less safe. Now, if everybody would wear a mask and make less aerosol, I think there might be less risk. Problem is, it's really difficult to eat and wear a mask. So that's why I think indoor dining may be a really difficult uh, place for reopening. Yeah, 
And of course, the big debate now with WHO finally saying that aerosol has something to do with it and 200 scientists saying that we should focus more on it. Uh, I mean, that debate is going to continue, but uh, you're right. Just wearing a mask is going to solve a lot of that. Okay, another question. Are there technologies available or on the horizon that will allow an individual to perform a test at home and get the results immediately similar to a pregnancy test? Short answer is yes. Uh, their home, is, uh, home testing is one of the uh, options. Uh, we've seen, Yuka and I have seen in this uh, steering panel that we're on, uh, several companies that are you know, going in that direction. Uh, but I don't think it, there's gonna be anything like that available till next year. Yuka? Yeah, I mean, so the lateral flow format is really interesting where you put your specimen on one side and then it flows across and there's a control line for positivity and then sort of a disease line. And um, that's been used actually in the antibody format to say that you've been exposed. Now you can look for antigen directly. You can look for parts of the SARS-CoV virus and notice it on a lateral flow device. The innovation is coming around how to concentrate the specimen to improve the sensitivity. Remember I told you that the antigen test that's currently on the market doesn't have the same level of sensitivity. Now that may be okay actually in the asymptomatic phase when the people who are most likely to transmit to you probably have a lot of virus. So if we can at least find those people and get them out of circulation, that may be good enough for everybody. So maybe having the best level of sensitivity isn't the bar we should be going for, but there are, um, people that are trying to concentrate the virus and then um, see if they can detect it. They're interestingly also isothermal, meaning at one temperature amplification methods that also are looking for a lateral flow output. Um, and maybe some of these interesting CRISPR casts that have a fluorescence output that could also be done on lateral flow. So I think you should stay tuned. I think this is a really area both for antigen and for amplification technologies that are isothermal to have a lot output that could potentially be performed at home with diverse sample types. Obviously, they're either going to have to be you shove a swab into your nose or the back of your throat or you spit and the saliva is tested. Those are going to be the three options. It has to be some place where you actually have the virus. A uh, couple questions about antibody titers. Uh, any uh, data on how long the titers remain detectable? This is the million dollar question. I think that uh, the NIH has a serologic goal. The National Cancer Institute got a huge amount of money to study serologic responses in addition to generalized. Um, $330 million. Host, yeah, host immunity. So there's a lot of calls out right now for this. Of course, you don't know how long it lasts because we first found two in COVID-19 disease in December. So the longest, someone can have an antibody response would be seven months. So I think you have to stay tuned. We can though get some data or understand from SARS-CoV-1 that titers definitely wane. And that was seen sometime between six months and two years. However, there are also papers that show that a memory B cell response could uh, last for much longer, up to five years. So there may be people who would be protected long-term, but the million dollar question now is, can people get reinfected with SARS-CoV-2 when their antibodies wane? And I suppose right now the answer is we don't know. How about air quality on planes um, where <laughs> the air is pressurized and recirculated? First, some of the newer planes actually do, get, do take fresh air into the system, so they're not all completely recirculated. But I mean, I still think the primary problem on the airplanes is people not wearing a mask. Yuka, what do you think? Yeah, so you all know the airline industry is not doing well right now. The more fresh air you bring into your plane, actually, it, the, the more it costs you because you have to heat that air for it to be manageable for the people inside. So it turns out that when you get to altitude, you're getting less fresh air than when you're at the beginning of your journey. And so I think it's going to be, um, I think again, it's same thing that we were talking about with restaurants, it's an enclosed space and I think your risk would be higher. If you ask me, am I flying? Both Rob and I used to do a lot of flying with Global Health and right now I am not flying. Yeah, I'm not flying either. Uh, we've got a lot of questions and we're running out of time. So one uh, a question, um, 
How many truly asymptomatic people out there compared to those that are pre-symptomatic? I think they're mostly pre-symptomatic, right? Um, well, I can tell you in an older population, we have data from Hopkins that tested over a thousand people that were in assisted living facilities. Mm -hmm. When they just did a blind test, they had 330 that were positive of whom 80% then went on to get symptomatic disease. Mm -hmm. That's in an old population. Yeah. I think in younger populations, there's a huge number of people of asymptomatic infection. But the disappointing part is that likely those people don't also mount a particularly good antibody response. And I would worry that they are at risk for getting infected again. So if we have this reservoir of young people who keep getting asymptomatically infected, that really puts older people at much higher risk if we don't all start doing non-pharmaceutical interventions. All right. Yuka, thanks so much. I think we're, we've run out of time. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions, um, but I want to thank everybody for attending today. I want to thank Dr. Manabi for taking the time to share uh, her experiences and work with us, uh, and for everyone for joining us and for your questions. And we hope that you'll join us uh, September on Friday, September 4th at noon for our next First Friday webinar. We're not, we're not having it in August. Uh, and the next webinar is entitled The Criminalization of Women's Health in El Salvador, two case studies in health and human rights. And again, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Uh, and uh, 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 for those of you who registered, or if you know anyone that registered and couldn't, there is a recording of the webinar that will be shared, uh, shared by email shortly. And this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, Yuka, for joining Thanks. us. Thank you, everyone.